Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to talk to you today about hypoparathyroidism. I also want to thank Irene and Jennifer for their efforts in organizing this historic conference. So, just this here. The different etiologies of hypoparathyroidism can be divided into acquired, which are the most common, uh, usually due to surgery, post-surgical hypoparathyroidism, and the congenital forms are indeed very rare disorders, and there are several. I will focus on um, two, obviously APS1, and also I want to, uh, for a little bit in my talk, focus on autosomal dominant hypocalcemia with hypercalciuria, because I think this uh, disorder has helped me understand this disease so much better and forced me to um, move forward and find more physiologic therapy for hypoparathyroidism. So Jennifer and Michalis already went through this and did a, a beautiful job in describing the uh, diagnosis, so I won't belabor this. I just want to say that hypoparathyroidism is usually the very first endocrine disorder of um, this disease that is manifested usually uh, before puberty in early childhood in, in most people, but it, it can be really in any time of life. There are six endocrine conditions associated with APS1, and for the endocrinologist, each of these conditions are pretty straightforward to screen diagnose and to treat. Now the treatment uh, for all the disorders is with its missing hormone. But until very recently, hypoparathyroidism was not treated with its missing hormone. It's the only classic hormonal insufficiency state that was not treated with its missing hormone. But in January 2015, the FDA approved PTH 1 to 84. So this, I, th I think, is really a landmark event for patients who have hypoparathyroidism, that now PTH is available uh, for therapy and is recognized as a therapy for hypoparathyroidism. And, but it's interesting, the FDA approved it, but sort of in, in a very half-hearted way and said that it had to be for patients who are uh, refractory uh, to uh, calcium and, and calcitriol, which, are the, which is the conventional therapy. So um, in the absence of PTH, there is a loss of action of PTH uh, on the bone, which uh, PTH has a direct effect on the bone, which is the main reservoir of calcium, phosphorus, and in, in actually magnesium. And uh, there's a loss of direct action on the kidney to, uh, for enhancing tubular reabsorption of calcium. And also another important action on the kidney is to, uh, uh, is, is for the, stimula the stimulation of the formation of the active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, which then has a direct effect on the intestinal tract to reabsorb calcium. So calcitriol, calcitriol and calcium is the conventional therapy and the, and the principle behind calcitriol is to flood, uh, calcitriol and calcium is to flood the intestinal tract with calcium throughout the day, usually extremely large doses uh, of calcium throughout the day, and then to give the active form of vitamin D to potentiate the absorption of the, the calcium, uh, the, the supplemental calcium, and also the um, dietary calcium in the intestinal tract. But in APS1, many patients have malabsorption, and therefore they are unable 
to not only absorb their dietary calcium, but they can't absorb their medications. And this is not only true of the calcium and calcitriol, it's also true of many of the other, uh, including the hydrocortisone for adrenal insufficiency. So this is essentially what makes the APS1 patients so difficult to manage on um, conventional therapy. So the adverse effects of vitamin D are really um, focused mainly on the kidney. And uh, vitamin D, because it doesn't have the renal calcium retaining effect of PTH, causes hypercalciuria, nephrocalcinosis, nephrolithiasis, renal insufficiency, and renal failure. And in the the NIH cohort of 54 patients with APS1, 42 had imaging, either CT or ultrasound. Only uh, out of these 42, 32, 76 percent were positive for nephrocalcinosis. That's quite high. So let me uh, switch over to the other uh, the other form of hypoparathyroidism, and then I'll go back to APS1. So uh, the calcium sensing receptor mutation, uh, these patients are at very high risk of renal damage. And why is that? Because this genetic defect inappropriately signals an apparent hypercalcemic state. And lead, uh, which leads to an increased renal calcium excretion even when the serum calcium levels are below the normal range. And this little insert just shows the uh, three of our patients and the calcium sensing receptor, which is a G protein coupled receptor, and where those defects, those mutations are located on, um, in the receptor itself. So just going back to the physiology um, for a second, the calcium receptor can be found in many areas of the body, including the parathyroid gland, the bone, the intestine, but for this disorder, most importantly, the kidney. And this receptor, which is locating, located in the thick ascending limb, of the kidney is um, the, what really causes the, the most problems for managing this disorder because it's, uh, this, this, this um, receptor in its disordered state and activated form that senses a higher level of, of um, serum calcium than really exists, so it senses an apparent hypercalcemic state, and therefore there's massive amounts of urine calcium even when the patient has very low serum calcium. So out of my 23 patients with this disorder, and this is a very rare disorder, 96 percent had nephro, only one did not have nephrocalcinosis, and that was a, uh, the daughter of one of my patients, and then um, I, this is when I first met her, but followed her for a couple of years uh, on calcitriol and, cal and uh, calcium, and then she developed nephrocalcinosis when I admitted her to my study. So essentially, at baseline for study, it's truly 100%. Four of these patients had renal failure when they came to me, and they didn't even know they were in renal failure. And these were young patients. They were in their early 20s. And this uh, just shows that for any given, um, the bottom panel shows that for any given uh, serum calcium, level of serum calcium, the uh, calcium receptor mutation patients, which are shown on the right, th these are mean uh, urine levels, will always be significantly higher than the acquired hypoparathyroidism. So we compared the calcium receptor mutation with the post-surgical hypopara patients, and we gave them P3 
PTH, and we thought that this would solve the problem. We looked at once daily PTH, and we looked at twice daily PTH. And you can see with the post-surgical uh, is in the, in the red, and the calcium receptor mutation is in the blue. And you can see on the top panel, once daily PTH is just not effective. But twice daily looks pretty good, and this is where you want to keep the calcium in pretty much most of the patients with hypoparathyroidism in the low normal or just below the normal range. And in this disorder, you certainly want to keep it just below the normal range. So this looked like it was an effective therapy. But then we looked at the urine calcium, and you can see on the right panel, the urine remains elevated, even though their calcium levels are below the normal range. So again, even twice daily PTH was not affected effective for the calcium sensing receptor patients. So as I said, the, um, the problems that we encounter with, with these uh, cases of uh, congenital hypoparathyroidism are a mere magnification of problems that we encounter with all patients with hypoparathyroidism. And we all agree, anyone who takes care of these patients agree that effective management involves the um, normalization of calcium in the blood and calcium in the urine. And this can be a lot more challenging than it appears. So why do we run into trouble with uh, PTH therapy? You'd think that PTH would solve this problem. And uh, the answer is, if you look at the direct effects of um, PTH, parathyroid hormone, given subcutaneously once a day on the kidney, we see that the typical response that we've all known for forever, really, uh, that you get a phosphateric effect, the, the uh, phosphate in the urine goes way up, cyclic AMP goes up, and the calcium excretion goes down. You get an in increased tubular reabsorption of calcium. But if you look at the calcium a little bit more carefully, you see it's biphasic, and it initially goes up. And it's um, in this, uh, this initial increase in urine calcium excretion that is clinically significant because if the PTH dose is large enough, this period of time uh, can be more prolonged and the urine calcium excretion can go above the normal range. And these periods of hypercalciuria, even on PTH, uh, even though they're intermittent, can cause um, nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis over time. So the question is, how, how can you remedy this, this uh, problem? The, the data I just showed you was on once, once daily PTH, which requires higher doses of PTH given once daily. But if you, re, if you increase the frequency of the injection, you, th you can thereby reduce the dose and with reducing the dose, you can reduce the level of calcium excretion. And that's what is shown here in a simplified version of, of pretty much the, the various sequential um, studies that I have done, once daily, twice daily, and then the pump, where you go from 1.4 to 0.5 microgram per kilo per day, and then on the pump, you go to 0.2 microgram per kilo per day where you have actually um, urine, ca uh, urine calcium in the low normal range. So with increased frequency of PTH injections, you have reduced daily dose in most cases by 50%, decreased urine calcium excretion. And this is what one would would aim for. But what about uh, 
the PTH dose effect on the bone. And this is the other area that PTH has a direct effect on in the bone. And so one has to normalize uh, the homeostasis, the calcium homeostasis in the bone as well. So as one would expect, giving, giving PTH uh, raises uh, the markers of bone turnover and ha because it has a direct effect on the bone. And these markers, we found, uh, remain elevated for three years. And this is in adult patients over a three-year period obtained every six months. And this is compared to calcitriol, which really does not have any direct effect on the bone. It doesn't in enhance uh, the bone turnover, so you don't have a rise in markers of bone turnover. But does this have an effect on the bone density? That's an important question. So looking at DEXA scans uh, over time, every six months, uh, the, the uh, data obtained while the patients are on PTH is in red. And you can see there is no uh, uh, significant rise or fall in bone mineral density or bone mineral content over the three years. And this is, for adults, this is a very good result. This is what you want. You do not want a net rise or gain in adults with uh, BMD or BMC. But uh, comparing our data on the left, which is actually titrated, we titrate to normal calcium levels and urine calcium Compare, comparing this to others, uh, Natalie Cusano's group in New York, they uh, gave PTH 1 to 84 at higher doses but more intermittently. Um, the, the PTH 1 to 84 was given 100 micrograms every other day, and this caused an anabolic effect on the lumbar spine over four years. And in this, this group of patients, the uh, adult patients with hypopara who already have um, elevated levels of BMD and BMC, this is not an optimal result. So as, in, as we saw in the, in the uh, urine, does increasing the frequency and decreasing the dose of PTH also have a direct effect on the bone, and it turns out it does. So as you go from once daily to twice daily, then to the pump, you can see that the markers of bone formation, which are alkaline phosphatase, goes from way above the normal range to the high normal range to the mid-normal range. So over the two, past two decades, we have tried um, and with various studies to make this therapy, PTH replacement therapy of hypoparathyroidism, more physiologic. And um, it wasn't until we um, decided to use the pump that we felt that we had achieved a, a true physiologic replacement therapy. So what is normal PTH uh, secretory dynamics? What, what, what is normal physiology? And you can see here, um, the, this is a normal person without hypoparathyroidism uh, with, and this is a simplified version. This is um, actually done uh, to show you uh, sort of what the pattern is. And these are ionized calcium levels over um, a three-hour period. And it shows that there are these oscillations. I hate to call them spikes. They're oscillations. They're pulses of PTH, usually about three or four per hour, depending on uh, what the stimulation is. And, and these pulses coming from the parathyroid gland are um, in response 
to uh, lowering and minute change, very minute changes of ionized calcium in the extracellular fluid. But when you give this person IV calcium, you can see there's an immediate drop of the PTH levels. Uh, but the PTH never goes down to zero. There's always tonic secretion of PTH. So uh, the normal physiology is that there, there is a basal tonic secretion of PTH with a superimposed um, pulsatile uh, secretion of PTH. And the insulin pump, and we use the Omnipod by Insulate, is probably the best, and this is, there are many insulin pumps. I'm not saying the Omnipod is necessarily better than it. They're all excellent for this, but the insulin pump is the best way to mimic the parathyroid physiology. So what we did was we put PTH in the reservoir instead of insulin. Other than that, we did not alter this pump at all. And the reason I use the insulin, the insulate pump, the Omnipod pump, is that there's, there's no um, tubing, and so I was afraid that the PTH would stick to the tubing that you have, say, in the Medtronic insulin pump. So this is an example of the lowest um, rate, basal rate, that I have given uh, to one of my post-surgical patients. So I initially did this in adults with post-surgical hypoparathyroidism. So otherwise healthy adults who happen to have had surgery, most of them had surgery on the thyroid, and therefore were rendered hypopara. And so the way this works is that for it, the, at the NIH, we use synthetic human parathyroid hormone. We did not use recombinant parathyroid hormone, which is Forteo. That was not available to us when we started these studies. And we started these studies in 1991, and that was uh, more than a decade before Forteo was approved for osteoporosis. So um, for the uh, concentration of PTH, which is 200 micrograms per mL, each of the microboluses that are delivered in this pump were invariant. They're 0.1, very small, 0.1 micrograms, and the, the actual magnitude of the microbolus does not change. But the interval between the microboluses do change, and it's these intervals that, uh, that, that um, actually determine the basal rate. And um, so this is uh, three pulses an hour, so each of these pulses are every 20 minutes, and that's only 7.2 micrograms a day. So imagine this, uh, this young woman uh, did absolutely perfectly well, had normal urine, and serum calcium on 7.2 micrograms of PTH a day. Now, then after the post-surgical patients, I thought, well, I'm going to go to the most difficult patients I can find, and I found those patients with the APS1 and the calcium receptor mutation patients, and um, we looked at the pump comparing twice daily. So each patient is a randomized crossover study so each patient was on three months of, of pump or twice daily PTH, and then they switched over to the opposite therapy and uh, was on three, uh, three months of that therapy. So you can see in the um, closed circles that the serum calcium is very steady state normal over time, exactly where you'd want to have it in the low normal uh, range. Uh, with same thing with urine, without any fluctuation, and this is very physiologic. Um, now, the twice daily was looked pretty good too, um, but it has a typical, you know, biphasic uh, pattern where the calcium rises and peaks around four to six hours, comes down and rises again after the second injection, 
and then comes down. Same thing with the urine. As I explained to you earlier, you have these these uh, periodic rise in uh, increases in urine calcium excretion after the injection is given. And then comparing the calcium receptor and the APS1 patients, the calcium receptor mutation, true to their mutation, if you look at the serum calcium in the, uh, the calcium receptors in the, in the uh, dark circles, so in the serum calcium is always lower than the APS1, and urine calcium is always higher than the APS1 patients. And the APS1 patients actually handle um, calcium in the urine very similar to the post-surgical patients, completely normal. The only reason I would have to give them more uh, you know, PTH is if they have malabsorption and they're malabsorbing their uh, diet, uh, dietary calcium because they don't receive calcitriol and calcium supplements along with PTH. And what about the markers of bone turnover? As I mentioned before, the markers of bone turnover are completely normalized in the mid-normal range. So markers of bone formation, bone-specific ALKFOS, osteocalcin, um, and then bone resorption and entelopeptide, all in the uh, mid, even low normal range. And it's interesting comparing the adults with post-surgical, who are just healthy adults, no, um, no malabsorption, uh, no problems with their kidney necessarily. They all had mostly normal kidney function. Uh, and um, uh, didn't have a mutation in their calcium receptor. So it's interesting that the adults required about half the amount of PTH on the pump and the twice daily injections compared to the children with APS1 and, and calcium receptor mutation patients. So the pump, the, the uh, adults needed 0.17 microgram per kilo per day whereas the children needed 0.32 micrograms per kilo per day. So the physiologic, so we have to raise the bar even higher and say the physiologic treatment, effective treatment requires a maintenance of normal calcium homeostasis in the blood, in the kidney, and also in the bone. And this was achieved for the first time with pump delivery of PTH. So in summary, treatment of congenital hypoparathyroidism, some forms of congenital hypoparathyroidism are challenging to manage due to disordered calcium regulation in the kidney, as in the calcium receptor mutation patients, or the presence of chronic malabsorption, as in APS1, and are thus considered refractory to, con uh, to conventional therapy. PTH treatment for APS1 and calcium receptor mutation patients also has challenges, but with individualized titrated doses given by injection or pump, one can effectively control calcium homeostasis and avoid adverse side effects. So in summary, uh, further summary to, to the key therapeutic principles that I just went through, the large doses of PTH will lead to hypercalciuria and elevation in markers of bone turnover. And adverse dose-dependent effects on the kidney and bone can be avoided with smaller and more frequent doses and the goal should be to normalize serum calcium, urine calcium, and markers of bone turnover. And so where are we going in the future? What are the research needs for this area? First of all, I think, and you probably all agree with this, we need a monitoring device. We need a monitoring device for blood calcium. 
with the precision and accuracy of blood glucose monitoring for diabetes. I mean, the diabetics, imagine a diabetic not knowing what their glucose level is when they're having symptoms and having to rely on going to the emergency room to find out what their blood glucose level is. That would be absurd. Well, that's what calcium, that's what hypopara uh, patients have done forever, and, and they're still doing it. It just is, it's, the, the technology is there. We really need monitoring devices, and we need, we need the precision and accuracy that the diabetics have with their devices. And also, long-term effects of pump therapy on the bone and, ki and the kidney are uh, n needed. We, we don't know, really. I've only, we had three months, so we need to know long-term maybe a year, two years, what, what are the effects? And then uh, PTH peptides with altered PK profiles should be explored, such as long-acting PTH. I think this is an exciting area. And also, since PTH 1 to 84 is now approved, we need a direct comparison in the same patient population of PTH 1 to 34 and PTH 1 to 84. Thank you very much for your attention.